Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Paul, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Talking Time Pieces, where we talk about watch collecting and horology. Today, um, I wanted to start the conversation by uh, talking about technology, you see, because watch, the watch industry and watch technology, um, it revolves around the other technology that we exist with in our lives. Um, one of the examples of that is when I was a young man, I, I grew up in New York City and I would go to Canal Street and I would, uh, hey, hey, how's it going, Renee? Um, and I would go to Canal Street and I would notice that the quality of the fake watches kept getting better. And uh, that's because the core technologies are getting better. Uh, machine technology is getting better. CNC technology is getting better. And now we have technologies like 3D printing and other things. All right. So um, I wanted to address some of the technology issues in our lives and how it mixes into the watch industry. Uh, one of the things, for example, in the watch industry has been the incorporation of silicon as a component, not as, not as electronics, all right? And I recognize there are people who don't quite get the difference between silicon as a part in a watch and silicon as an electronic component in a watch. But the bottom line is, is that silicon is essentially glass, right? So if I can make a, something out of glass, like a pallet fork or, um, a uh, escapement, the entire escapement, using silicon as a material, as a material, as glass, then I have something that is incredibly rigid and something that is amagnetic, which is why Omega, I'm wearing a sword, I was just, I was wearing my Omega earlier today, wristwatch check, I'm wearing my funky, Sorna from the 70s, you know, you couldn't make a watch like this today. The, 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 the evil thing about the 70s were a, a lot of the watches were just bought out of catalogs and assembled by watch companies. But that also allowed companies to be funky and cool and interesting because they didn't have a lot of skin in the game. So you had watches like Sorna, which I talk about a little bit in my uh, vintage watch piece, but I'm going to do a special in-depth video on this, because this is just a cool example of the best of the 70s. But the bottom line is, we are wedded to the technology that creates the devices in our lives. And um, silicon is just another technology. And I've heard people crap on silicon components and they like genuflect in the direction of the artificial sapphire and the artificial rubies that are in the watch what's the difference between artificial sapphire and uh silicon component to use an artificial sapphire for the crystal because it's scratch resistant or using uh synthetic rubies for the uh pivot points because they're consistent and then to turn your nose up at uh, silicon components. I used to think it was being a Luddite. Uh, now I think it's just being a snob because initially I could say a bit of Luddism because they may not have understood the technology completely. But at this point, uh, we're at a stage in the industry where um, if you don't understand the core technologies, you shouldn't be talking about them. I mean, Bottom line, if you don't understand what you're talking about, shut up and leave the room. So, uh, and for example, uh, Bill Sanders over at Watch uh, Art Sci, he used to just simply dismiss silicon out of hand and conflate them with uh, quartz watches. And uh, he's been corrected multiple times. And now he just simply says he doesn't like them, which is I can, I can respect someone saying they don't like something. But to say you don't like synthetic components, but you accept 
synthetic silic, uh, synthetic um, sapphire and you accept synthetic rubies, then you're, you are, you're being a snob. You're not being a Luddite. You understand the technology. You're just being a snob because you choose one kind of artificial technology over another kind of artificial technology, but they're both artificial technologies. There's no difference. If I'm growing an artificial crystal in a vat, it's an artificial, artificial crystal in a vat. It doesn't matter what the crystal is. Now, what I'm using with the crystals is important. In the case of sapphire, you're using them to make the crystal on the, uh, I just realized I was bumping the table and shaking the camera, my apologies. But <clears throat> if you're using silicon as a component, it's completely different than using silicon as an electronic device. And I think we're past that, please. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about technology is the interesting thing about silicon is the fact it's being used in watch components, which is an incredibly niche market because nobody needs watches. Watches could disappear tomorrow and nobody would give a crap. All right. Watches are a hobby at this stage. Um, as long as your phone tells you the time today and everything around you tells you the time today and time is a commodity, we don't need watches. So the fact that they're making advanced micro electromechanical machine design technology and watches shows you how mature silicon is. And another aspect of maturity of silicon is something I'm going to tell you now that some people aren't aware of, but it's a fact in that silicon is obsolete in power electronics. Silicon is completely obsolete in power electronics. If you're, if you're making a device today, be it cell phone, which has the time, oh, time. Um, if you're making an electronic device today and you're using silicon in the power electronics, you're a generation behind all of your competitors that aren't. And when I say that aren't, is because obviously there are a lot of people who use the old technology, but there are two materials in the electronics industry. And um, this is the reason I really wanted to have the uh, video. It, today's topic is because I wanted to um, let you all know about advances in embedded electronics because we're all hobbyists in the watch world and most watch hobbyists, not all, but most watch hobbyists are technologists. And my day job, I'm an embedded electronics journalist and I figured let me tell you some of the things that I'm seeing on the other side of that fence and one of those things that I'm seeing is that uh, silicon transistors are obsolete for power electronics um, you may have seen in the news um, about people uh, talking about Tesla having this chip revolution the chip revolution that Tesla is currently having is in power electronics. They're replaced, they've replaced the uh, silicon power transistors and IGBTs and the like in the powertrain of their cars with uh, silicon carbide, which is one of the two materials that have replaced silicon in power electronics. Silicon is still valid for uh, microcontrollers and silicon is still valid for other logic devices and other uh, technologies of that nature, but anything involving power switching, uh, energy management, power management, rectifying, silicon is obsolete. If you're using silicon in your designs, yeah, please change. Um, hey, Alex. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you appreciate because the thing is, is that watch people are technologists. And so this is going to be the technology episode. And if, if you, we want to just talk about tech, ask any question about tech, because as I point out uh, my day job, I am a journalist in the embedded technology space. And I was going to say in this issue, in this episode, <clears throat> I just interviewed a dear friend of mine, Alex Lido. Alex Lido is literally one of the most gifted and famous electronic engineers in the United States. He was on the team that disassembled the uh, MiG-25 that defected. He uh, was the CEO of International Rectifier. He's currently, he, he founded and is currently the CEO of Efficient Power Conversion, which is a gallium nitride uh, power technology company, which is the other material that has replaced silicon. Weirdly enough, 
Providence has um, chosen to give us two replacements for silicon, one well-suited for low power applications and one well-suited for high power applications. And there's a healthy overlap in the middle, but we are literally going through a power electronics revolution that 90% of the people on the planet don't know about because it's happening at the engineering level. And you're only hearing things like Tesla having a chip revolution. And the reason they say that is because the people who are writing the headlines don't understand the technology they're reporting on because they wouldn't just simply say chip revolution because they just simply read Tesla chips. But it's when people hear chips, they think logic. But it, the Tesla chip revolution is, is in the powertrain. They're, they're using silicon carbide in their powertrain instead of silicon. Now, to make it very blunt and simple, if silicon is a one, silicon carbide is a three. If silicon is a one, gallium nitride is a three. And each has a benefit. Silicon carbide <clears throat> is extremely well suited for very high temperatures and very, very high voltages because silicon carbide is essentially electronic sapphire. It's almost as hard as diamond. And the leftover pieces from silicon carbide manufacture are sold to the jewelry market as moissanite artificial diamond. So if you see moissanite artificial diamond in the industry, that's the leftovers from making silicon carbide. Now, and before we figured out how to make silicon carbide as a single crystal lump, and I can't call it a single crystal ingot because silicon can grow in liquid. And so you get these beautiful ingots that look like an angel took a doot because it's long. A silicon ingot today, a modern silicon ingot is about a foot wide, 30 centimeters. It's about six foot tall, shiny silver, and pointy at each end. It looks like an angel took a doot. <clears throat> now, silicon carbide. The thing about silicon carbide, I didn't realize I needed to wet my whistle. I'm drinking my favorite uh, bottled beer, Augustiner uh, Edelstoff. And Edelstoff in Germany means literally fantastic stuff. Um, but yeah, so silicon carbide, the, 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 the joke in the basket with silicon carbide is... If you know uh, dry ice, carbon dioxide, dry ice sublimates. It goes from solid to gas. There's no liquid state. Silicon carbide also goes from solid to gas. There's no liquid state. So to grow a solid ingot, single crystal of silicon carbide, you have to grow it in an oven with a plasma as hot as the sun to grow it. So it's really hard. But the bottom line is, is that these technologies are advancing power electronics. On the other side, you've got the software revolution. You've got artificial intelligence and edge computing and cloud computing and the like. And I could go into it. But I noticed that we actually lost one of our uh, the, you know, uh, viewers. Is there something else that you'd like to talk about to uh, bring uh, the uh, interest back to the episode? Maybe people didn't want to talk about technology today. But we'll see maybe this episode has a long tail and if anybody does have uh, questions about uh, embedded technology then uh, please leave them in the comments but at this point i think that i will go back into a tangent and uh, talk about <clears throat> the core technology and watches and if i don't get a lot of uh, we don't get a lot of traction with today's episode i'll end it in 15 minutes on the half hour to spare everybody the uh, pain of me dying on stage as it were but um technology does make a big difference in watchmaking i mean um i believe it was antoine or andre i forget the gentleman's name but um le cote one of uh, the founder he created the uh millimeter millionometer, whatever the, the, the specific name he gave it, to measure a micron. And the thing is, is that watchmaking is wedded to technology. You cannot separate the two. 
um, you have a lot of people, they look to say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, hand this and hand that. They use their hands and then they take a precision measuring tool and then they measure. Hand work is perfectly fine, but everyone measures and measurement Precision measurement takes technology. So you can be a hand working artisan all day long, but you got a ruler, you got a square, you got calipers. You cannot divorce technology from watchmaking. And everyone who likes to pretend that watchmaking is some ethereal space where the best watches are made by eye. No, these are people using precision instruments, using very precise tools. They would laugh at this as a piece of crap, as imprecise, the tools they use in watchmaking to measure, because you could be Mr. or Ms. Artisan all day. If you do not have a ruler whose points are precisely the right distance apart, how are you gonna get precision? We hear all of these people, I'm not gonna name names, but there are people who just go into rapturous praise over elegant artwork. But at the end of the day, those same artisans use precision tools. You cannot divorce the technology from the watchmaking. So let's look at what we're talking about. Uh, Renee, the watch industry has always improved the technologies. A watch from the 50s is already different from an 18. Exactly. And a watch from today is different from a watch of yesteryear. So um, I saw something on the internet that uh, really made me think, and it pointed out that the 80s, right? 80 to 90, 90 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10, 10 to 20. The 80s are as far away from us as the 40s were from them. And we're already in a, I mean, we are at the arguable near peak of a roller coaster of development that started with the solid stateification of electronics. Uh, Jack Kilby and uh, some people at Fairchild, Jack Kilby was at Texas Instruments and some people at Fairchild who regrettably, I forget their name off the top of my head, but Kilby gets all the most of the credit. So I'll use his name. But uh, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments developed, it, developed the first integrated circuit and the people at Fairchild did it in parallel engineering. Uh, they didn't know what and they each had different strengths. And at the end of the day, they wound up with some kind of hybrid agreement. But the moment we were able to shift from vacuum tubes to transistors, the world changed. And if you think about it, that happened in the early 60s, right? And I was born in the early 60s. So in my lifetime, we have literally gone from vacuum tubes to quantum computing and artificial intelligence and cloud computing and internet of things and what I'm doing right now with all of you. We've really come a comically long way and it's not at an end and it's gonna impact watches. And we just have to think about how will we allow technology to impact watches? It's how we will allow technology in an earlier show, I was talking about that. We decide what happens with the watch industry. We cannot allow the watch companies to decide what happens with the watch industry. We are the consumers. We have to decide the direction the market goes. So, for example, I, I like these new silicon resonant movements like Zenith, the Zenith Inventor. And... Um, Frédéric Constant also has a, a silicon resonator movement. These are not silicon electronics. These are literally mechanical devices using the interesting physical properties of silicon to make interesting watch movements. Now, <clears throat> we, we you know when you when you start thinking about that, 
we have a bunch of directions to go in. One of the directions is computer-aided design. Almost every watch movement designed in this century, in other words, in the last 20 years, uh, were all designed on a computer. I mean, they were designed in, they were designed on paper and they were played within models, but they were dialed in on a computer with a 3D design program. And that's the other part of technology that people are not seeing. Some are. And that's the fact that COVID kind of provided a perfect storm to accelerate the development of um, interactive, cooperative design software. So I could have a design team and I've got engineers all around the planet and they can all work in real time on a design and the latest devices, I can even have an oscilloscope in XYZ country and have an engineer in another country controlling that oscilloscope through the cloud. So we've entered the, 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 the COVID thing and the sequestration because of COVID created a perfect storm for better telepresence software. And what that also allows is when you think about it, I now design in a software environment, which I can do real time tweaks to that the software design. And then that design goes to prototyping. And I probably ordered those modules already from various distributors because that software now ties into those distributors ordering networks and it creates the bill of materials. And I already get my prototype parts from the distributors who are tied into my program, like something like Altium. Um, and then I make my prototype and then I go to, uh, to building it and I'm in a Six Sigma facility and Six Sigma just means one failure in a million, six zeros. And uh, so if I'm in a Six Sigma facility and I'm manufacturing in software, I can now take the design software and I can adjust the manufacturing on the fly which is what Tesla is doing in both um, SpaceX and in uh, the car company, the eponymous car company. And But not just them. I've spoken to a lot of companies. And if you're not doing real-time design and doing real-time manufacturing management with feedback from the design, we have a problem, we change it, and we fix it so the next lot of product is better, you're going to lose to the companies that are doing it. So let's look at some other stuff. Uh, of course, the process of improvement will continue. This is also very true because it's the pressure. It's the competitive pressure, right? Because if I am not using the latest technologies to make my product, unless I am riding on the coattails of my name or my brand, I'm going to lose to the person who can make a better product. For example, <clears throat> this is something a lot of people don't realize or know, all right? Um, the Tissot PRX. Everyone is going nuts over the Tissot PRX and the, how they can you can get the automatic, the Powermatic 80 in the Tissot PRX, and um, you're well under $1,000 for a phenomenal watch, and it is. A lot of people don't realize that the Powermatic 80 movement was a spinoff of the Swatch System 51 development. A lot of people in the watch industry don't even know what the Swatch System 51 program was, but those that do know, know that the Swatch System 51 is the first watch completely built by a machine. No human hands were involved. It's the first time ever, 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 ever that an automatic, I mean, that a manual mechanical, I mean, it's an automatic winding, but a, a mechanical watch was completely made by a machine. And that was Swatch System 51. The balance wheel adjustment was done by laser trimming. Now, the Powermatic 80 uses the Swatch System 51 technology, which is how they can get away with a movement in a mechanical watch, right? With only, uh, what, less than $300 markup from the quartz version to the mechanical version, and you're getting a great watch. So this is what I was telling other people is that the Swatch System 51 was a harbinger not to replace high-end mechanical watches, but to bring mechanical watch technology down to a price point where everyone, see, in a sense, 
System 51 is 50 years too late, 40 years too late, because if the Swiss watch industry had made better and more efficient mechanical watches, quartz watches wouldn't have been able to challenge them on the price point, right? So technology is, as much as people try to ignore it, and every time they try to ignore it, it bites them in the butt, right? The Swiss ignored quartz. They developed the Beta 1. They developed quartz watches. But their, their mechanism, which is one of the things when I um, think when I've said that the automobile industry is going through their own quartz crisis, it is directly apt because the Swiss watch, mechanical watch companies, their supply chain, their way of doing business was so ingrained in all this hands-on, they couldn't make the transition to a mostly mechanized manufacturing process because the quartz watch did not require a lot of hands work to make. So again, the car manufacturers, a gasoline car company is trying to make an electric car, an electric car from a gasoline company's point of view evolved, right? Each individual subsystem was electronic and they've grown together to become an electric vehicle. So in a modern electric vehicle from an internal combustion engine, ICE company, is um, there's like a dozen massive computer chips inside this vehicle, each to control all these different subsystems that evolved into these intelligent subsystems. Whereas a company like Tesla, they created the car from whole cloth. They didn't have to integrate these disparate systems that had their own supply chains. Like Toyota looked at a Tesla and they're like, we'd have to fire seven out of 10 of our suppliers. What, what, what does that do to the supply chain and the economy? See, so that's the big dilemma these people find themselves in. And so the watch industry had that problem in the 70s. Uh, and then they're still going through it now. And the funny thing is, is that it's no longer a quartz crisis, right? Because a smartwatch doesn't have a quartz oscillator in it. It's running off internet time. So quartz watches have been completely bypassed. There is no quartz crisis anymore, but there's still a smartwatch crisis, right? The issue is technology migrates. And so uh, a watch, a mechanical watch has to migrate with that as well. And so I think, for example, the Tissot PRX is a perfect example of a great watch. It lets people have a fun, beautiful, well-made, awesome mechanical watch for under a thousand bucks. And in a world where you don't need a watch, that's a, I don't, I, I, I refuse to call it entry level because that means you need to go somewhere after that and you can buy it and be done with it. So I would call it a basic, don't call it entry level, but uh, that kind of watch is awesome. Um, let's see, what material or upcoming industry will impact industries in general and watchmaking as well? Uh, Alex, uh, <clears throat> Alexander, well, I was saying about um, these new power semiconductors are literally going to change the world. People don't even realize how important it is, how significant it is that these new technologies are literally... 200% better than silicon, right? So we're talking silicon's a one, and gallium nitride and silicon carbide are three. That's why we have, that's why we have wall warts. This, you know, wall wart is a power supply you plug into a wall is the industry jargon. But that's why we have power supplies that are 60 watts that are this big. You can put 60 watts into a size this big for love or money 10 years ago. Um, the fact that these technologies are so great for energy density and power conversion is why nobody talks about range anymore. A new Tesla can go f as far as anybody needs to go in one drive before they should take a break anyway. You know, a modern electric car can go 500 kilometers without breaking a sweat. Um, the power electronics are so good now that 
car manufacturers are actually reducing the size of the batteries because they can get away with it to reduce the weight of the vehicle. So, and so as, as where it reflects on watches, like I said, is where you're starting to see silicon being used as a material because they've literally been used for everything else now. There are microelectromechanical devices inside your phone. Where do you think the gyroscope and the accelerometer? They're, they're MEMS devices. And they're MEMS devices at the nano scale. And so these are the same technologies being used at the macro scale in electronics terms to make a pallet fork. I can see a pallet fork with my eyes. So frankly, the use of silicon parts in a watch demonstrates how mature the silicon industry is and why it's obsolete as a power electronics technology. Like I said, silicon is still valid as a logic technology, but if you're, if you're making your power trans, if you're using silicon power transistors in your product, unless you're making something legacy or you're tied into a long-term contract, you are going to lose against people using gallium nitride or silicon carbide in their power electronics. I'm serious as a heart attack. And I'm a guy who has a ACDC power circuit tattooed to their arm. Um, but does anybody have any watch questions? Let's see. Let's look through the questions. Uh, I think you were talking about the Swissmatic movement, which is developed from the System 51. The Powermatic 80 is a more modern 2824. No, no, no. You're right, Renee. The Powermatic 80 is a more modern 2824, but it's made using many of the System 51 tech. Its balance wheel is laser trimmed. No human being adjusts the Powermatic 80 balance wheel. It's laser trimmed, which is System 51 tech. I'm not saying that the Powermatic 80 is, you, is made on the Swatch product line. I'm saying that the Powermatic 80 uses a lot of the technologies that were pioneered in the System 51. In the future, anything that's not hand adjusted is going to have a laser trimmed balance wheel. It's getting there. I mean, the, all the Powermatic 80 balance wheels are laser trimmed. Correct. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my information is uh, System 50. The, the, the Powermatic 80 is using System 51 technology, and that means machine assembled parts, laser adjusted balance wheels, um, very, very few human hands involved in the Powermatic 80, which is another reason they slowed down the beat because you slow down the beat. You don't just increase your um, power reserve. You also decrease wear. Uh, Swissmatic and Powermatic are very different. Well, um, the Swissmatic movement, you know what? Let me look it up real quick. Um, well, I'm not saying I'm not saying that the Swissmatic movement is the same as the Powermatic movement. I'm saying the Powermatic movement uses System 51 technology, right? And so um, the Swissmatic, the way I I, I don't want to go into too much while we're in the middle of a live show, but I, I see the Swissmatic as a brand. Uh, uh, within the uh, line, but uh, the Powermatic 80 is a technology, and the Powermatic 80 movement's used actually in quite a few watches within the uh, Swatch group. Well, uh, Renee, um, I believe if you investigate, you'll find the Powermatic 80 is also uh, laser trimmed. I. I would mail you a bottle of scotch if you prove me wrong. And because I wouldn't, I mean, this is a conversation. Maybe you have better sources than I, but um, the uh, Powermatic 80, it, it, it's it got a laser trimmed uh, balance wheel. <clears throat> Last time I checked. Of course, they share general movement. Well, see, that's the, that's the other thing is that we could be agreeing on the same thing, but just approaching it from different directions. Uh, technology is a concept 
right? Application is different. It's like 3D printing. 3D printing is a concept. Whether you're doing 3D printing by ablating with a laser or gluing powder particles together or using laser light to solidify a colloid, which are all 3D printing technologies, the concept of 3D printing is the same. So in the case of System 51 technology, it's not that the specific application of how they do it, it's the various concepts involved in the various creation of the subsystems that make that aspect. It's like um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, Tesla revolutionized not just the electric car industry, but the manufacturing industry with the Gigapress. They're, they're making entire rear ends now in a single cast. And that actually eliminates about 600 robots from the assembly line. And a lot of people don't think about those kind of ramifications. So if you're able to manufacture a watch movement in a mechanical assembly line, a good watch movement like the Powermatic 80, you can sell a watch like the Tissot PRX for what, 800 bucks, 900 bucks with a mechanical movement in it. It makes a big difference. Hey, Danan J. I hope I pronounced it right. I know what I'm going to do. Make great handmade watches with great handwork. We'll have both quartz and mechanical variants, and the price will be no more than 100 Well, you know what? It's possible. It really is. Because if you think about it, Swatch became a worldwide thing. And when they started, their watches were around 100 bucks a pop. And actually, I wish I had my hands on some of the first generation Swatches because some of them had like backroom movements from Breguet and from all of the... Because the first generation Swatch, a lot of the backer companies... Uh, used it as an ex opportunity to dump a lot of their back stock. I had a Swatch Diver. It kills me that I don't have it anymore. It had 24 jewels in it. It was probably some really beautiful movement from some really beautiful Swiss watch. And a lot of those companies dump their movements through the first generation Swatches. Um, when it comes to watch manufacturing, don't forget, there's like a 10 time markup from the watchmaking to when it gets to your hands. So a thousand dollar watch only costs about a hundred bucks to make and a hundred buck watch costs only about 10 bucks to make. So if you wanted to be altruistic, you could make a watch for 20 bucks, take half the profit and still hit a hundred bucks a pop. And you can make a lot of watch for 20 bucks if you're making 1,000, 10,000 watches. It's the volume that makes it with watches. The, that's why uh, companies like Alange and Suna and so, their watches aren't that expensive because it's that hard to make. But when you're only making 100 of something, you don't have economies of scale. All that stuff costs comical amounts of money. So... Um, being able to manufacture in volume helps you tremendously with your costs. Let's see. Wonder 10, how you doing? Um, I opened my election electronic and was surprised by the hybrid movement between mechanical and electric. Election, that must be a type, I think it's a, that must be a, um, uh, 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 a web, uh, text edit because I don't I think you didn't mean election but you opened your electronic watch and you were surprised by a hybrid movement well there are a couple of hybrid movements out in the industry there's the uh, mecha quartz which you referred to but a lot of people don't know that the Rolex oyster quartz is a hybrid movement it's uh, not a straight up quartz the Rolex oyster quartz um, was a one hertz with a pallet fork a one hertz movement, because the pallet fork was how the Rolex ticked. Um, it was a one hertz movement driven by a quartz motor. So they had a stable drive reference. So it allowed them to be flamboyant and create, I think there's maybe one or two other companies on the planet that made a one hertz 
clock movement. And they're almost all, I think the FP Jorn is also a one hertz, um, but they're all hybrid quartz movements. The uh, Seiko, the Seiko spring drive is a hybrid movement because it's using an electronic clutch to uh, regulate instead of an escapement. But um, other hybrid I can think of, yeah, Mecha Quartz, Oyster Quartz, uh, the FP Jorn. Well, the Accutron and all of the tuning fork movements were also hybrid movements because you they used electronics to drive the tuning fork. And then they used the uh, tuning fork resonance to mechanically drive the watch movement. So there are at least three or four uh, hybrid technologies out there for watchmaking and probably more because people are inventive. Uh, well, the step between mecha and quartz movements, I would arguably say would be uh, the tuning fork, the Accutron, because it was electronically driven to get them tuning fork running, but then it used the tuning fork to mechanically drive the uh, watch gears. Or in the case of like, for example, the Oyster Quartz, they used a quartz driven motor to drive the escapement. Or the spring drive, which is a completely mechanical movement, but instead of a pallet fork escapement, it uses an electromechanical clutch driven by the parasitic energy from the magnetic drive slowing down the the mechanical spring driven movement, hence the term spring drive. Let's see. The regulation of the power matic adhesive by screws on the balance wheel. If the power matic 80 was uh, done by screws on the balance wheel, it would be a free sprung uh, balance. And um, actually, I, that's a lot of looking up I would have to do. But um, if a watch movement is regulated. If the balance wheel is regulated by weights on the balance, it's a free sprung balance because um, the only reason you would have weights on the balance is because you can't, you don't have that second arm that allows you to adjust the tilt on the balance wheel. Now, if if they're saying in the paperwork that it's adjusted by trimming the weight on the balance, then it's laser trimmed because they're literally burning away weight on the balance. So if they're saying it's um, balanced by adjusting the weight on the balance wheel, it's laser trim because no human being is turning screws on that thing. I mean, you not for 200 and for, for a $260 uh, markup on, there's no human being touching that movement. But like I said, um, if they're saying that it's adjusted by trimming weight from the, or adjusting the weight on the balance wheel, it's because it's, it's laser adjusted. They're ablating weight from the balance wheel where it's too much. Um, System 51 and systematic motors are fully machine assembled. No, I didn't say that the Powermatic was fully machine assembled. I'm saying that the Powermatic uses System 51 technology. This is, uh, 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 Rene is coming back with this, by the way. I didn't want to leave him out of his name out of it because he's making some very good arguments. Um, but uh, the thing is, is that it's not that the Powermatic 80 is machine made, it's that the Powermatic 80 is using a lot of the innovations that were developed in the System 51, and one of them is the balance wheel. System 51 is systematic to fully. Yes, this Powermatic is using a free sprung balance. The Powermatic 80 is a free sprung balance. I, I, I honestly cannot believe how they could make it affordable if it's a free sprung. Uh, let's see, Powermatic 80. I'm actually gonna look it up right now while we're... Um, balance. And um, yeah, I, cause I, you know, the thing is I don't wanna, I, 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 I wanna educate myself. I, if, if I am wrong, I will admit at this moment that I am wrong. Um, it looks deeper than, because there, there's this whole piece on the Watch Insider. Um, 
you have made me want to look into this deeper. Like I said, if I'm wrong, I will stand corrected. And it looks like um, we might be somewhere in the middle on this because they, they may be uh, using a combination of both uh, technologies. But no, I like and respect you, Renee. I'm not, I'm not going to leave you in the lurch. I'll give you a solid answer uh, on this. But yeah, if the Powermatic 80 is a free sprung balance, then they've hit it out of the park. They really have, uh, because if they can offer a free sprung balance under a thousand um, dollars, I, I literally can't think of any other company right now off the top of my head's offering because the the the, the, the um, movement it's based on isn't a free sprung balance. So, no, Renee, I, I, I owe you a complete follow up on that. So, uh, Neil, did you see the? 5711 Tiffany dial. Mad world. Well, it is a mad world, right? I mean, let's talk about watches here, right? Watches are an interesting mix of technology, right? Which is what we were talking about, and marketing and popularity, right? The only watch that was worn on the moon that could be legally sold sold for about $2 million, right? The uh, Bulova Lunar Pilot, the original Bulova Lunar Pilot, worn on the moon. All the other watches worn on the moon, I mean, there were some Rolexes that were on the moon, but they were under the spacesuit, so they were passengers. But all of the watches worn on the moon as working watches, all the Speedmasters were property of NASA. So the only watch that was worn on the moon that was owned by a private individual Sold for about $2 million, right? We're not on the moon. Lunar dust in the crevices. And Paul Newman's Daytona sells for $20 million. So you can't, you can't judge the market. The market wants what the market wants. And there are watches that are great watches that are fantastic, horological, historical, and something worn by an actor blows it out of the water. So, um, yeah. The fact that that Tiffany, everyone's going nuts over a, 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 a teal, turquoise watch face just shows you where the market is. Half the market are watch collectors and half the market are luxury collectors, but that's every market. You have to accept both ends. That's the other side of it, right? I mean, every industry has got its high end and its low end. So um, if we love this industry, we have to accept the crazy stuff. You know, uh, if we have to accept the exotic stuff. We have to accept the cheap stuff because that's what a market is. And we just have to try to make it the best market we can by being as the best collectors and consumers and participants that we can and help influence the market with our dollars and our voices. Simple as that. Now, the Bull of a Lunar Pilot, it is a great watch. <laughs> the Newman is more valid. Yeah. But uh, Neil says he's got the uh, the bull of a lunar pilot. The lunar the bull of a lunar pilot is the is if you were going to buy a quartz daily wear knock around fun watch the the lunar the the new bull of a lunar pilot the latest I mean is just a cool watch. It's big. It's beautiful. It historic and it's an it's an homage by the company that made the original. So it's a true homage. Um, and it uses a high beat quartz movement, 260 some odd, 264 megahertz or something along those lines. It's a high beat quartz movement. So it's accurate. So it, 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 it hits all the buttons, historical and horological in the quartz side, because uh, quartz is as obsolete as mechanical now, right? If you think about it. If I'm wearing an Apple watch, there's not a quartz oscillator in there, right? So uh, quartz today 
is as obsolete as a mechanical watch today. There's no reason to wear a G-Shock, just as there's no reason to wear a Patek. Um, the quartz watch is as obsolete as the mechanical watch because um, the smartwatch is the new uh, contender in that realm, as it were. Uh, yeah, the Newman. The funny thing about the Newman is nobody gave a crap about it until Paul Newman wore it, right? But then that's half of watch make, well, it's a, it's a tripod, right? Everything needs three legs to stand. That's not intelligent. Um, you've got watches like uh, the Newman, which are famous because people wore them. You've got watches like the Speedmaster, which are famous because what people have done with them, or the Explorer, although the Explorer was an homage made to the Rolex that um, was worn on Everest, but it was a Rolex worn on Everest. Also, there was a Smith's. Nobody recognizes the Smith's because well, their, their marketing department kind of sucked, I guess. They still do, obviously, um, but they were there too. But you've got watches that are famous because of what they've done. And then you've got watches famous because they've spent enough money that everybody knows what their name is, right? Um, I like to think that I swim in the first pool, you know, watches that are famous because of what they are and what they, you know, or first pool or second pool, I forgot which pool, but you know what I mean. In other words, I don't want a watch that's famous because somebody famous wore it or just because of good marketing. I want to watch uh, because it's got something interesting to tell me or show me, like this Sorna, vintage from the 70s. Um, a watch that'll be part of the horological collection journey, you know, uh, which is why I bought my, uh, an Explorer 2 again. I sold all my Rolexes because I was disgusted with Rolex, and then I missed the Explorer 2, and I realized, well, frankly, that was the last real tool watch they made, so it was a fitting thing to buy it again. So that's the only Rolex in my collection is the Explorer 2, which is the last real tool watch they made. All the others are like playing at being tool watches, but sh shiny luxury goods trying to become part of the triumvirate, which frankly, Jeju Le Coq has a way better claim to being part of the top shelf than Rolex ever could be because the piece, the, the, the crappiest piece of crap, crap, that Jeju Lecote ever made is better than the best piece of watch Rolex ever will produce, in my humble opinion. You know, I, I, you know, yeah. That a company like Jeju Lecote gets under-recognized while a company... But then again, that's how the marketplace goes. But um, where we are. Jean Anger, um, be it a rich man or a poor man, both breathe the same air. I don't think the difference in quality should be based on the cost of the piece. I agree. I've said that many times. Is um, well, this is something I said before. The difference between crap and good is tangible. You know, a, a piece of crap and something that is worthwhile, obvious difference. The difference between something that's good. And something that's great is pretty tangible, right? But the difference between something that's great and something that's luxury is very intangible. And most of it is perception, right? And um, I used to sell, I was sales manager here in Germany for Monster Cable. Perfect example. A lot of people thought Monster Cable was a lot of smoke and mirrors, but it was half true. A good pair of cables will sound better than a crap pair of cables. But then... The expensive cables didn't do you that much better, but um, that was the marketing part. But good is always better than crap. It, the difference is to determine where the good and the great stop and the marketing and the value add, perception value add begin, you know, which is why I talk about brands like uh, Mido, and uh, Oris and Jeju Lecote, all, all comically 
unrecognized, underrecognized for what they do. Let's see. The only really valuable, Wonder Tan Guy, the only really valuable watch I own is the one my wife offered me as I had to become a father. Well, that's the shadow fourth realm of watch collecting watches that we have for sentimental reasons, right? Um, a watch that your father owned, a watch that your mother owned, a watch that your uncle, grandfather. The beautiful thing about watches is a mechanical watch, well-maintained, will last multiple lifetimes. I've got watches in my collection. I hope my daughters decide to keep after I pass. I mean, they'll probably sell most of them. But I hope they keep a couple, uh, the Globe Master, and um, look at it and go, yeah, that was my dad's favorite watch. Because sentimental value is a value. It's a real value. I mean, Pulp Fiction built a whole subplot on it with the watch crammed up uh, Christopher Walken's unmentionables. JLC versus Glashütte original, which gives you the more bang for the buck? Alexander's question. Um, that's a hard question. That really is a hard question because I really like the Glashütte original movements. Their movements. I love, I, I really like Glashütte original movements. Jail. Um, I would I would say that they are on par and depending on the model. Well, the trouble is, is that the JLC's got some really high-end models too. I would say that they're on par, and if you start looking at price points, probably marginally better value in the movements. But JLC faces are awesome. JLC applied indices, textured dials, just really beautiful, beautiful dials. And Glasshuda Originals got some nice dials too, but they don't have any Glasshuda design language. You know what I mean? Like if you look at a Glasshuda dial, you say, like, oh, beautiful sunburst or a nice enamel. Great greens, beautiful blues. Is it a Moser? Not sure what it is. But you look at a JLC. JLC has managed to establish, I would say, two, maybe three clear lines of design where people can recognize it from a distance. The reverso, of course, you can tell from across a room. Um, their Memovox Polaris family and um, their master control and, you know, their higher end stuff. Um, Glasshuta original, I, their design language is very strong and beautiful, but it's like a mullet, you know, their business in the front and it's all in the back. You look at a you look at a glass Huda original in the back and breathtakingly beautiful watch, phenomenal horology. Their quasi uh, micro rotor, like demi rotor movements are awesome. Um, I think they need to be a little more bold up front. Their I think their face designs are too sober because you to be that plain you need to be plainer like look at look at um alangian Suna, like a saxonia right that's a plain watch with a beautiful movement but when you see it that plain up front you know there's something really heavy duty going on in the back whereas glass Huta, they've got some interesting faces but they, like I said, they don't exhibit a design language and they look nice. So you don't expect what you see in the back and they are beautiful. 
they are beautiful in the back. They really are. So I think, um, I think it's more of a case of, I guess, brand awareness. The more people understand what Glass Huta original represents, I think the better they'll do. And the trouble is when you go by that side, marketing's hard to promote craftsmanship because that's a educated sell. You're not just throwing your name in front of everybody. So um, they're in a tough spot and I, I, I can respect them for it, but they do, they make fantastic pieces. But I would say just as Alange and Serna is a competitor and in some ways beats Patek, I would say Glassuta Original is on par with uh, JLC. And actually I think JLC is on par with Patek. And so they should all be up there. Glasuta and Alange and Patek and uh, Vacheron Constantin and uh, Audemars Piguet. Because, I mean, show me how, how an Audemars Piguet movement is superior to a Glasuta original movement. Not really. I mean, they got the market, but the movements aren't that much better. Really. Glassuta Original makes some phenomenal movements. Alangans, they all, I think, um, even even Nomos, if you talk about the, 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 the Glassuta companies, even Nomos has got some beautiful stuff. Like, Nomos makes me think of Frédéric Constant. You know, that, that kind of design, the simplicity, the cleanliness, trying to get the biggest bang for the buck. But yeah, no, Glassuta Original is a great company. I'm, I wouldn't put down either company. I would say yes to both. If, I, if you allow me. If you haven't heard of the uh, ST1908 movement, consider get an eye on it. A big bang for the buck, mechanical chromo. This is Wonder Tangai, the ST1908 movement with date and real moose, moon phase complications. I'll have to take a look at that one. Um, and it doesn't even look cheap, he says. Well, so if it's a, if it's a mechanical chrono with date and moon phase, I'm guessing it might for less than two hundred bucks. I'm guessing it's probably Chinese, and the Chinese are making huge, huge strides in better movements. They really, I mean, well, CNC machines and you know micro mechanical fabrication. They make iPhones, right? You know, they're the reason they're struggling with their watch industry and growing it organically is no one's paying them to do it. But they're they're making strong strides. They're not there yet, but they're getting there fast. Ironically, you're on because you're unwell, Jim. Oh, I hope, Jim, you feel better. Um, oh, we're at the end of the hour. If anybody does, I just noticed that we're at the end of the hour. If someone doesn't have a question, we'll go ahead and close out the episode. Seagull. I love Seagull, uh, Wonder Tan guy. Um, like I said, the Chinese are really, really giving the Swiss a run for their money at the low end, which is, um, and I'm going to look that up for you, Renee, about the uh, Powermatic 80, because if I do stand corrected, I will... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a post on the website. Rene was right. I was wrong. And I'll explain all of the, because I'll explain why I thought I was right. Because uh, that way, at least I'll have an excuse for my idiocy if I was wrong. The crown has play in it. Well, um, you can have a mechanical watch and there's going to be some play. The crown probably has play in it because they there are things you can pay attention to. And they probably decided that that wasn't an area that they had to really pay a lot of attention to because they wanted to worry more about maybe the escapement or some other aspect of the movement. As long as the crown worked, they figured it was okay. Well, Renee... Um, thanks for the show and we will sort out the Powermatic thing. Maybe both of us are right. I think, I think that's probably what it is, Renee. I think we're probably both right a little. And I looked at the picture. I will grant you now, you're probably more right than I am because I saw a screw there. And I'm thinking that's probably for like, um, 
a large correction, but I could be wrong, but I saw a screw there. So you're definitely right there, but I'm going to look deeper and I'll get a bigger explanation. And we'll maybe we'll do an episode just on the Powermatic 80 to sort all that out. But um, QC is still an issue on, uh, this is Wonder Tan guy talking about Seagull. Well, QC is an issue, but then again, Seiko still has a QC issue. They're, they're famous for their indices not lining up, and they've been doing watches for a hell of a lot longer than Chinese, right? So, gents. Oh, Jonathan, thanks. Take care, everybody. We are at the end of the hour. And um, like I said, I'd rather have unfinished thoughts that we could pick up in the next episode than run everybody into the ground in a really long one. So we'll keep this one to the hour. Take care, everybody. Please subscribe. Tell your friends, at least if you are subscribed, and have a great day. And stream. Take care, everybody. Live long and prosper. <laughs>